So this question comes in from Chase, and Chase left me an audio uh, voice message. He actually sent me a very, very long email, and instead of reading the whole thing, I asked him just to kind of summarize it up in an audio note. So I'm going to go ahead and play that question for you. And as always, if you have a question on how to start, grow, or save your business, go to businessbootcamppodcast.com. I like when you send, send the audio clips uh, via that little widget I got there. Uh, and if not, feel free to fill out the form or email me at businessbootcamppodcast.com at gmail.com. So without any further delay, here is a question from Chase. It's a couple minutes long, and then we'll jump right into the answer. Here we go. Hey, Mike. My name is Chase Reed. I'm 23 years old, and I live in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, and I own an online furniture company called Blackbird Furniture Co. Uh, I've been doing the business full-time now for about a year and a half. Um, I started the business in 2013, more of a hobby than anything else, but I've been doing it full-time, like I said, for about a year and a half. Um, and business was going really good uh, up until this past summer uh, when I decided to change the name of the company. But the original name just didn't make any sense with furniture and the direction that I wanted to take it. So I, I decided to change the name um, and thought it would be a good idea. But w- once I did that, the uh, sales that I had coming in were almost completely dropped for about two months. Um, so it scared me big time. Um, but I think long term, it's still probably it was probably still a good idea. But uh, luckily, sales have picked back up. Um, they're not to where they were, but they're still um, they're still picking up slowly but surely. Um, but really, the question I had for you was: is I right now myself and my wife are pulling basically all the financials out of the business to pay for our personal bills. My wife watches our kid uh, uh, for most of the time out of the week. She works part-time, but um, so we're basically starving my business, and I am kind of feel like I'm stuck right now. I, I have an option to uh, take a loan, um, and it's a, it's from uh, friends and family, and, I, and I'm not sure if I should take the loan or not, but I just feel like I don't really have any other option right now to scale the business, and I was just seeing uh, what you think. All righty, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, so thank you for that, Chase. Uh, I wanted to address the first question that wasn't really a question but he talked about there about rebranding his furniture company and so I've had several of these questions I don't think I've done a podcast episode on rebranding rebranding is really really something you got to take carefully but you need to do it strategically and at the right time and when I say the right time usually the right time is right now Uh, a lot of times people wait too long to rebrand or change their name and then once the company is of size and they realize it's it's uh, holding them back or it is limiting their growth, then they're like, oh, I need to change my name and everything. And by that time, they've already got a substantial following and they already have a substantial business. And it's much more difficult both legally and then also from a consumer standpoint and the people that you're supplying, if you're in some sort of a manufacturing like furniture, it's very hard to get that transition to be smooth. So when it comes to rebranding, I would ask yourself the questions number one, and I talk about this a lot, is working backwards. Where do you want the company to be? What do you want it to look like in 10 years? And then ask yourself the question, is the current branding that you have now, uh, is it going to be what you want it to be? Is, is it going to be the, is it going to have the infrastructure? Is the brand, whether it be, it be the logo or the name of the company, is that going to have the infrastructure to which you can build your business? I look at the branding, especially your logo and like, uh, name, especially the name of your company. I look at it as kind of like the the scaffolding to a, a skyscraper. They build up the scaffolding and then the building gets built or like underneath that scaffolding. And so that scaffolding, if it only goes, you know, five stories, there's no way you're going to build some 20 story building. You got to build that scaffolding to the height in which you want that building to be built and then build the building. In other words, build the business, build out the consumers and the customers and things like that, build out the operations. And so if you're early in your business, I would say definitely ask yourself, if you want it to be a $10 million company, you better make sure your branding doesn't sound like someone that's coming out of their garage. Because if it is, you might make it a $100,000, $200,000 company, but you'll never get it to $10 million. So ask yourself the question, number one, when it comes to branding, the name of your company, I would definitely 
ask yourself the question, where do you want the company to be in 10 years? And if that brand, if that name of your company is going to limit, are you building a five story scaffolding brand name when you're trying, you have the ambition and the drive and the goal to make a 20 story building or business. So ask yourself that question. And then from that, I think you will probably make some changes. For instance, when it comes to landscaping and in the course uh, that I teach, landscapebusinesscourse.com, we talk a lot about starting your business, what the name of your company should be. And one of the things in our industry, landscaping, is a lot of times people will name it after themselves. They'll name it Matt's Lawn Care, Bob's Lawn Care, uh, A&A, and I go do some something like their initials, uh, lawn care service or landscaping. And the problem with that is if they ever want to sell the company, if they ever want to hand that down to somebody else, if I call it Mike's Lawn Care, uh, every time there's a customer issue, people want to talk to, obviously, Mike, because he's the owner and he's going to fix it and he's he has his name on the board, right? So that's, that's one thing about naming your company. Another thing about naming your company is don't make it geographically binding if your ambition is to grow. For instance, you'll see landscape, I'll use landscapers for an, for, for an example, people will call it, uh, you know, Seattle Lawn Care, or they'll call it their city's name lawn care, or their county's lawn care, or landscaping, or whatever. The problem with that is if you ever do dominate your market and you're like, hey, I want to go in a different market, now all of a sudden you have a limiting factor as far as your name of your business because it's limiting you to a certain geographical location. And so, I really encourage people to think deeply about Brandly branding, what it needs to be. I think brand loyalty and is what will keep people around regardless of price. Uh, as more and more industries get commoditized, uh, whether that be from technology or just the rapid pace in which companies like Amazon and Apple and Google are taking industries over, uh, more, as more and more things become commoditized, the companies that won't get washed out by these massive conglomerates and companies and corporations are going to be the ones that have created brand loyalty and by to do that, you have to create a strong brand, whether that be imaging, website, uh, your creative, obviously product quality and your service and things like that all tie into it. However, the name of your company and the logo is important. And so that's what we're kind of talking about here with, with, uh, with Chase and his furniture company. So what happened here with Chase is he had a decent little company going and then realized, hey, my branding's off. I need to rebrand this company. And I think, Chase, you made the long-term, as you said, the, the right long-term decision, realizing that, hey, my long-term ambition for this company is bigger than the, the name is going to allow it to get. So you changed. There's obviously going to be some short-term repercussions to that, to which customers have known you for a long time at a certain name, and then you change. Now, that being said, I, I would say there's a different way you can, can rebrand, and that is essentially to start a new, quote-unquote, new company and start a new brand and a new name with a new logo if that is what you need for the financial backing, for instance, you know Chase. In this case, he needed the he needs the funds. He needs the 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 finances that was coming in from the previous business. And now with Blackbird Furniture, uh, he could he what he could have done is could have started the Blackbird Furniture, let his other company still run underneath the old brand. And by the way, let the market decide. Like the the old brand, you might not have liked it, but it could have been the one that the market liked, right? So uh, I would let let it run its course, but then open this new one, new one that you think is going to grow bigger. It has a brand identity to grow much and scale much larger and start that up. And so I think when people think about rebranding, they think it as a one or zero kind of all or nothing score net game. Whereas you can think of it more as almost starting a new brand, letting the old one slowly pitter out or slowly transitioning customers to the new brand. Whether that be if you're manufacturing, you might need to be switching over the, the, the retailers that you are supplying to. If you are in a, a, a business to consumer a service company, it might mean after a year or two, you switch them over slowly through software, through emails, getting them switched over to a new brand. And it might mean literally for a while running two different companies, uh, allowing your old brand to serve a certain demographic that is going to 
identify with that brand image more and then allowing your new one to uh, really be the growth factor and where you eventually go. So I think about branding a little bit differently when you're rebranding. It should be a slow process. It should be if you're trying to keep customers or it should be one in which the, the brand continues on and then later on down the road, once another one has sprouted off, then they merge and it's a little more uh, contiguous for the your, your, your customers. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, rebranding is always every single case is different as far as how it should be handled. So that was just kind of something I want to pop in there. I know Chase, you've already done that. You've already kind of cut ties with the old company and you have Blackbird Furniture. And so uh, now going forward, the question is, all right, I need to scale. I need to grow. There's potential in this company. Should I borrow money from investors, family? Should I go raise cash for equity? What should I be doing when I need the money. So I have a little bit of a different stance on this. It's a little bit conservative, but uh, this is this is just my opinion. And so I don't feel that you should uh, borrow money unless it's going to fund new sales. So what I mean by that is, people always say, "Well, I need more money." Okay, well, what's the money going to be used for? Well, I'm going to go get um, get go get new. Uh, uh, I, it's going to be so I can expand. Okay, how are you going to expand? If essentially, if you keep asking the questions, it's going to come down to someone's got to make a sale. So you've heard me talk about this before, but sales is is by far and large the biggest part of being an entrepreneur, especially when you're under, you know, 20, 30 million in sales and you aren't you know, focusing a massive amount on HR or operations. Sales becomes a massive part of your role as the business owner and the entrepreneur. It is to fund the growth of the company by keeping the pipeline full. And so, I really feel that borrowing money is sometimes a massive issue because what happens, like ask yourself the question, I'm not, I'm not being hard on you Chase or anything, but ask yourself the question, what are you gonna do with the money? Are you just gonna buy new equipment? Are you gonna buy some storage? Are you gonna buy materials? Like materials and inventory isn't gonna make you money, right? It might appease a few customers that have asked for a certain type of furniture or something like that, but it isn't going to make you more, you gotta go out and make sales. And whether that means committing to something you can't even do yet, that is fine as long as you have a deadline in which you know you can then get the money, fund the, fund those uh, POs, those purchase orders, and go out and then make the cash and be able to pay it back quickly because you have purchase orders in hand. So what I mean by that is I talk about this a lot in on, on the Landscape Business Course podcast is when people are wanting to start their landscaping business, there's really no point to go out and buy $200,000 worth of equipment without testing the market, without going and making sales. You can literally, for a landscaping business, start in February, March, go out and pre-sale 20, 30 people with their lawn care and making sure that you got them on schedule and there are your customer come from the mowing spring in March or April and then really go into this growing season knowing that once you buy that equipment, it's already gonna be used and that you already have a, a market there to use your services. What I see a lot of people doing is they think that money's gonna solve the issue, but when they get the money, they buy assets like equipment or a truck or some storage space or an office facility. And what happens is then they realize, oh, that wasn't the issue, and they go out and get more money. And then they then eventually what is, oh, they finally come, it dawns on them. I need sales. And so what do they do? Go re raise more money, get more money from investors, but more debt. And then finally they put it in towards marketing, but because they've never done any marketing, they're they Put, they, they essentially put a bunch of cash into marketing venues they've never tested. They don't know the demographic. They don't know the vertical. They don't know the conversion rates. They don't know if the money is actually going to give any sort of return. They don't know what type of clients come from each medium of advertising. These are some of the things we're talking about in our webinar in a couple of weeks. And, and these are the things that people do. They finally figure out after raising money, getting equipment and getting a beautiful website and getting all this beautiful stationery and hiring a bunch of people and they borrowing, borrowing and borrowing it from family, borrowing it from the bank. Um, they might even get some uh, angel investing and equity position and things like that. And then all of a sudden they realize that sales is the governing force of their growth. And then they push a bunch of money towards marketing. That marketing money is not spent wisely because they have no idea what they're doing and they haven't tested it over time. And then a business fails. And I'm not saying chase to you that this is what's going to happen to you. 
I would just be very careful to for everyone out there to not borrow money for the sake of borrowing money in the thinking that it's going to make your business grow. Because of Silicon Valley, because of these tech startups that do require millions of dollars to get started and off the ground based after just a simple idea and they need literally millions of dollars to even try to give it a shot, because of that has been so widely publicized on entrepreneur.com and other websites and and magazines and everything like that. And that's kind of been put put on a pedestal in our entrepreneur land industry. Um, because it's been, that has been the case. Small business owners now think that they have to go out and raise a bunch of money and get a bunch of hype as far as uh, an investor and, and bank and loans and lines of credit. And that is somehow they, how they feel they need to, uh, that's the path they need to go down to become a quote unquote entrepreneur. Because if you're not taking risk, you're not an entrepreneur. I don't believe that for a minute. And I truly believe that you should take debt. You should take other people's money if you have the sales to back it up. So what I would suggest you do, Chase, is instead of focusing on what equipment you need, I don't know what that the money you are going to be getting, is, how much it is, or what it's going to be used for. However, I would say right now, go out right now and focus 100% of your time on sales and not 100%, but like, you know what I mean? Like focus a lot of your energy on sales, getting purchase orders, even if it's above and beyond the inventory or what you can produce, go out there and make the sale. Commit and then figure it out later. Commit to the sale. Say, yes, in two months, we will deliver these pieces of furniture. And in your mind, you're like, I've never done this piece of furniture. I don't know how to use that type of material. Or I'm going to need this type of machine to make that that order be fulfilled. Okay, but I made a $100,000 order. Fantastic. Now go home. Figure out how you got to go then raise money because you got to get the $20,000 piece of equipment to to manufacture those pieces of furniture. However, now you have a $100,000 purchase order trying to get maybe even some of that money up front, however you want to do that. But then you can go to an investor. You can go to someone and say, hey, I have a $100,000 purchase order. Number one, you're going to get better terms when you have that. Number two, you have a lot less risk knowing that when you make that investment, that $20,000 investment, and I call it an investment, but it's really a risk in getting that loan or getting that money or equity position. When you take that risk, now it's hedged because you know because of that risk, you're going to make that $100,000 sale. So what I, I would recommend before you go out and get a bank loan, before you go out and get a line of credit from your bank or do whatever, getting investors or family money, whatever it is, make sure that your sales are in far excess of your current production. So for our company, Landscape, my landscape business, Augusta Lawn Care Services, that we are looking to franchise, by the way. Uh, what we do is I'm just a touch ahead as far as uh, getting equipment and things like that. So for instance, 2018, we're wanting to scale up. We got our second location that we're going to be you know, getting people over at. So we got to get the equipment for there, trucks, trailers, office stuff like that, all that good stuff, right? So what we're doing is we're just a bit ahead as far as the supply and demand for the product, right? So I got to staff the place up, build it out, the, the second office. I got to get trucks and trailers for it. Yet, we haven't necessarily got the sales yet. That is not what I would recommend you doing if you don't have the cash. I would not recommend doing what I'm doing right now if there was if I was taking out a loan or is going into debt to do this, what we're doing with our second location, because I'm basically going on this new market, spending a bunch of money, putting a bunch of infrastructure in place without really even having any sales in place. That being said, what you can do when you're starting and you, you, and you don't have a bunch of cash on hand and you do need to do that in order to do that step, you would have to take out a loan or go into debt or get family money. Instead of doing that, what I would do if you were me right now and you were wanting to start a brand new location and you didn't have the cash just to dump it all in up front, because the reason I'm doing that is obviously because I know the market enough. I know it's going to become you know big next year. We're going to have a bunch of new customers and I know the market enough to where I know it's just going to happen. And, I, and the thing is there's low risk because I'm not going to debt and I don't have investors involved and things like that. So I'm blessed in that manner and I don't have to worry about this as much. But if you're just starting out, what I would do is right now I'd be going and pounding in the pavement, be, get, go get the 30, 40 customers, make sure that you're going to be able to at least cover your expenses for the new shop or the new location or your new business, cover the lease, 
cover your cost of employing people. And then you really go into the, into the operation a whole lot less risk, even if you do get investors or you do get a debt, because you know that at least you have guaranteed sales. You have guaranteed money coming in, because the last thing you want to do is put a bunch of money out, put a, go into debt, get investors, and then there not be any sales or customers to back it up and be able to pump money back into the business. So that was a long kind of detour, but all I'm saying is, I truly believe that you, money should only be used to fuel growth and to scale your business. It should, be the fi- it should be the fuel on the fire of the growth of your company. So if your company is growing super fast, more money is gonna help. It's gonna allow you to get more equipment, get new people, uh, expand in new marketplaces. It's gonna allow you to advertise, market, uh, get better people on your team. It's gonna allow you to do a whole bunch of stuff. However, make sure you have a fire before you put fuel on it. A bunch of gasoline just dumped out in the middle of a field is a fire hazard, it is a big issue. But if you have a fire blazing, adding more fuel to it, adding more cash, adding more uh, uh, money, and and whether it be from investors or debt or whatever it is, however you leverage yourself, it makes the fire bigger. In that case is the only time I feel you should be borrowing money. If you're not bar, if you don't have any fire, if you don't have a sales that is just literally as soon as like customers are as, as a fire would just like be consuming and burning things up and expanding and constantly hot and trying to seek new areas to burn. If you don't have that type of a business where there's that that much demand, and there's not a demand to f- that that fuel can take off on. There's no fire, no spark don't use any fuel. It's just going to become an issue. It's going to become a hazard. It's going to be a place that people can't go or you're going to have to go clean up because there's no fire to burn it up. So uh, make sure you have a business that has a fire before you put the fuel of cash, whether it be from debt, investors, or whatever it is. So I hope that helped you, Chase. I know it wasn't directly exactly at your furniture company. And obviously every single Every single instance in which money gets involved as far as investment for a firm is is very, very uh, unique. So I don't want to be too broad in this. And I know there are exceptions to the rule that I'm making here. But I truly believe that you want to have sales in order first and then allow the cash to fund those purchase orders, whether that be services or products. This is Mike Andes. You're listening to Business Bootcamp Podcast. I hope you join me for the webinar and on our 2018 marketing plan, and we're going to create your very own plan for 2018, your strategy and your budget for your marketing. All you need to do is t- text Landscape Business. That's the old-fashioned SMS text. It's Landscape Business, one word, to 44222, and I'll see you on the webinar. Thank you so much for listening. As always, be great, because nothing else pays.